I know that Chapel Street was founded in 1894. Swedish residents of Geneva who were going to the only Swedish Baptist church in the area that happened to be in Batavia, and that was too far to take their horse-drawn buggies. So the lack of cars are why the church started. I'm Sylvia Helser. I have been here for eight decades. <laughs> Came when I was about five years old. My earliest memory is loving Sunday school. Being a child in that church, there's something about other adults in your life that make you feel so loved. You know your mom and dad love you, but to see these adults really care about us is just such a warm feeling. We were a family. When Dave and I were young parents, we lost a two-year-old child, and the support and love and care that we received from our friends in church more than from any other place was just what really helped us a lot and got, got through it. To watch it grow from a church of 10 and then 50 and then we build our South Street, current South Street campus and the plan for that was we would build a sanctuary that seated 250 people and we would start out with one service, but we wanted to go to two, and we would go to 500, and we didn't want to be any bigger because we wanted a small church. Well, God had other plans, and uh, then we built Kesslinger. And that was a huge step of faith. If, if Jesus wanted his church to grow, they wanted to allow that to, to happen. Any point in time, they could have said, nope, we're good. We have enough people, we have enough friends, we won't spend the money, we won't take the risk, we won't reach out. It started with those immigrants, and they came here that stayed in our DNA. We not only want to reach the people within our walls, we want to reach the people who are barely outside our doors, in the community somewhere, but then all over the whole world. That's what Jesus said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel, and we're, we're doing that. What has been really rewarding for me is we're supporting our own people that sat in our chairs and in our pews. That's really special. We've become ascending church. And there are our own students that went on short-term trips, that had their lives changed, and now it's those kids that have grown up and become young adults and with their spouses have gone off to hard places to make gospel impact. I'm sure the people who were in charge back when I first came to the First Baptist, they would never have dreamed that the church would become this big and able to offer so much, and yet remain true to the core of Jesus Christ as the, the main focus. That's it. I could sit and talk to Sylvia all day. Um, and just her last words there, to remain true to the core uh, of Jesus Christ, like that is the, the ongoing desire and vision. And when I just think about today, I think about, uh, so October 14th, tomorrow is technically 130 years uh, since the founding of what was originally the first Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva, and then First Baptist Church of Geneva, and now Chapel Street Church. What, what we... Uh, mark and remember is a legacy of the faithfulness of God over the course of time and working in various people and seeing how he has moved. It's not a story of any kind of human accomplishment. It's a story of God building his church uh, for the sake of his kingdom. And, and, and it is a story of the legacy of faithful generations before us who have prayed and who gave and who served and who set the path that, that we get to walk on now. Um, and, and there is a part of me that when we think about today, it's like you wanna, you wanna celebrate that faithfulness of God and you wanna honor the, the legacy of those who have gone before you. And so I just wanna tell all of you, I'm, I'm just really grateful for you. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm glad that we have the opportunity as a community to continue to do the work that God placed in the hearts of those few families 130 years ago. Um, never imagining what, what would be happening generations later and yet trusting God in the moment to do what he set in, in front of them. And we wanna, we wanna continue to live that out as a community and as a body and, um, and to see what God has in store for us. So just. Last week uh, was technically the seven-year anniversary of the Mill Creek campus. We opened in the first weekend of October in 2017. 
This week is the, the 130th anniversary of Chapel Street Church. We only have 123 more years to go uh, and we get our own sweatshirts. Uh, so pretty excited for that. Um, and I was excited when they told us I got to preach in a sweatshirt. So I was like, oh, casual Sunday. Um, I feel good about that. Why don't we pray and, and we'll open up God's word together. Father, we do. Um, we just want to acknowledge and, and praise you uh, for your goodness and the recognition of how you have been faithful. Lord, you build your church. You are the foundation. And so, God, we want to we recognize and acknowledge and worship you for the work that you continue to do. 130 years isn't a celebration of a human accomplishment. It's a celebration of the work God has done amongst his people. And so, God, we pray that you would continue to build your church, that you would continue to make us agents of your kingdom in the world around us. And Lord, that we would faithfully seek after you with all our hearts and minds. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I, uh, I got this idea from Andrew. It's all, it's all very British, uh, if you know Andrew. Um, but has anybody here ever heard of what's called the Thatcher effect or the Thatcher phenomenon? This was, it was uh, a study conducted uh, in like the 1980s by a, a British uh, psychologist out of the University of York. And uh, Peter Thompson recognized, acknowledged that, um, or discovered that when a face is turned upside down, that the human brain has difficulty detecting changes in that face. And so I have an example for you today. This is, does anybody recognize who that is? It's Adele, yeah. So you look at the face, it looks relatively normal. Maybe something feels different to you, but now turn it right side up. Yeah, her eyes were upside down in that original face and her lips as well, which becomes immediately evident to us when we see the, the picture turned right side up. And, and we have been in a series this fall where we're in a season, in a, in a time in our cultural or societal moment when people are, are proclaiming to us kingdom visions, right? They're asking for our allegiance to particular visions of a kingdom. And we've been seeking to return to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 as an attempt to reorient ourselves around the announcement of Jesus, of his kingdom, in breaking into our reality on, on earth. And the, the kingdom of God is what we most frequently refer to it. Matthew chooses the phrase, the kingdom of, of heaven. But not only is it the announcement of this inbreaking, it's also the simultaneous invitation to acknowledge Jesus as our kingdom to join him in this kingdom work. In doing so, Jesus is reorienting our perspective so that we're able to see as he shifts this understanding of the kingdom with clarity and, and with, with uh, foresight, the uh, brokenness and the disorienting aspects or the distorted aspects of the kingdoms of this world. So as Jesus is revealing to us his kingdom, the, the, the greed and the power struggles, the oppression of, uh, of the weak the, and marginalized, the denial of the image of God and, and other humans, and, and we're able to see it for what it is. This, this distorted and twisted version of God's created design. So this morning, we're going to continue to hold up Jesus' proclamation of his kingdom. These nine statements that we've been looking at where Jesus calls people blessed. And in doing so, to reorient ourselves around what he calls true and good. To reveal what is the fruit of the kingdoms of this world, even when to us it feels normal and ordinary. Throughout this series, we've been reciting the Beatitudes together each week. And so I want to invite you to stand with us for a moment. We'll do this kind of call and response as we've done each week. So if you'd stand, I'll read the, uh, the leader portion, and, and then you can respond as the congregation, beginning in Matthew chapter 5. 
It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be judged. Blessed are the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you're familiar at all with um, the Bible Project, I don't know if any of you are, have ever resourced that before, or fans of, of the Bible Project, but right now it's a, um, an online um, study. They're doing a deep dive in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And they've done a number of things, in particular around the Beatitudes, that, that I have found um, very helpful. But Tim Mackey, who's one of the founders of the Bible Project, and he's a Bible scholar and theologian, he, he suggests that as we look at these nine statements of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, that, that there's really kind of three groupings here. The first one, when Jesus talks about the poor in spirit and the mourning and the meek, He's talking about describing those who are coming to Jesus, who are entering into his kingdom. So it's almost like a fuller description of what Jesus later talks about when he says the last shall be first. It's this this idea of those who society marginalized in the way in which they are responding to the teaching of Jesus. This second triad, the second group of of three, Mackey suggests is, and I'm quoting him here, Jesus is painting a picture of the kind of people God is forming in the kingdom of heaven. So this is this description of, of as we enter into these, these, this, this uh, kingdom that Jesus extended the invitation to, who he's shaping us into be, beginning with what he says here in verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so I, I, I want to take our time this morning and really just to kind of process those three kind of categories, the hungry, the, the righteous, and, and the filled, to understand what Jesus is communicating here. So let's begin by looking at, at the hungry together. The hungry. I've mentioned this before, but I, I enjoy sometimes watching like, uh, like those survival shows, like Bear Grylls or or alone, if you've ever seen any shows like this. And if you're familiar with kind of those types of, of shows where they drop somebody off in the middle of nowhere and you're left to your own devices and, and the goal is essentially to survive, right? And one of the things that Bear Grylls or, or, or these uh, contestants on alone will immediately start to do is to answer the question, what is essential for my survival today? Like, what, what do I need? What is critical to ongoing of, of life? Like, they're not thinking long-term down the road. They're thinking about the things that are absolutely necessary. And as a youth pastor, we would do uh, pre-trip training for our students going on, on mission trips. It's sort of a group exercise. I would do this activity where the, the kids would get in groups, and I'd get them a list. I would do this sort of... Um, a scenario where the kids were imagining like a, a, a plane crash or something and they gathered together certain items and they had to travel a certain distance in order to, to find civilization. And they look at the items and they begin to prioritize them based on um, their immediate needs. And it was interesting always to listen to their discussions and to hear the debates about what things they felt like were highest priority and, and what things they felt like were unnecessary. And then you would compare it to the same list that was ordered by a, a survivalist, somebody who was experienced in this. And how, in, in view of things, there's things that we deem oftentimes to be absolutely critical, right, to our needs. And, and yet when understood accurately, right, there are other things that, that we understand are essential, that are necessary for life to continue. 
And as we dive into this, this look at the kind of people that God is forming in the kingdom of heaven, notice the way he begins here. He begins from a place of lacking, right? There's something that's missing. There is this unsatisfied hunger and thirst. And we'll talk more in a moment about what the unsatisfied desire is longing for. But for just a minute, I want us to camp out here as we consider what it means to be hungry, to be lacking something that is essential for our survival. I mention this because this is a metaphor that Jesus uses frequently throughout the Gospels, particularly in, in John's Gospel. Some of you might remember uh, sometime back we did a series around the I am statements of Jesus and, and John's Gospel, and one of them comes in a moment that was the, the, the context was all about hunger. Jesus has this massive crowd that's formed to listen to him teach and his disciples start wondering what they to, ought to do in order to feed him. And Jesus miraculously and powerfully takes a few fish and some loaves of bread and he feeds thousands of people. And then in the following chapter, Jesus begins to talk to his disciples about who he is, about his identity. And he says this in John chapter six, he says, I am the bread of life, whoever uh, comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Similarly, just a, a few chapters prior to that, Jesus has an encounter, a conversation with a Samaritan woman next to the, the well outside her city. Jesus asked her for some help in, in getting a drink of water, of, of quenching a need. This is the, the conversation that unfolds in John chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Which I, think, I find it's fascinating that Jesus meets her in a, in a place of need. That's where he finds common ground with her. Verse 8, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So like this hunger and thirst theme is all over this. The, Samaritans, uh, the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. And whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring welling up to eternal life. Jesus continues, he's constantly coming back using this metaphor as a means to communicate or to express not only the immediate need, but to express ultimate needs and, and eventually ultimate satisfaction, ultimate fulfillment. The metaphor is so powerful because it, it really connects with the human experience around a couple of our realities that we face. The first is obvious, and I've already mentioned it, but that's that's essentially our need, right? It acknowledges our state of lacking. It recognizes there's something that we're missing. It's more than a mere unmet desire. It is something that is essential to life flourishing. So essentially in the same way that we need life's most basic elements, those things that we talked about earlier, food and water and oxygen in order for us to, to not only survive but to flourish, Right? Jesus is now saying we need right relationships to each other and to our God and to his created world. We were, we were designed for it. In its absence, we exist in this perpetual state of, of, lack, uh, of lacking. And it's a painful reminder of our need, which brings us to that second reality of the metaphor. And that it's, it's marked by pain. It's marked by pain. Think, think for a moment, if you can, remember a time when you experienced like a really desperate sense of hunger. 
um, where you had gone without food for a, a certain amount of time. And I know for most of us in our culture, that's not something that we would experience regularly, but most of the time we have some kind of memory, right, of that. I can remember being like uh, on an airplane once where for whatever reason you're out on the runway and then the pilot comes over and says, we're gonna be just a bit delayed, it's gonna be half an hour. And you just keep saying that for like four hours, right? And the flight attendants begin to recognize that, that it had been a long time since a lot of people had eaten and so they started to pass out snacks. And you opened up the bag of pretzels right? and there's three pretzels in there. <laughs> Really? Like you're, what, what power does this, like, and I'm looking at my kid's bag of pretzels, like, next to me, wondering, like, I wonder if they're going to eat those kind of things. Like, like there's this, this metaphor is, is intended not only to evoke in us a sense of, of our lacking, but it's a lacking that's marked by pain. It, it, it's a bit muted, as I said, in, our, in a culture of surplus. Right? Hunger and thirst are generally, for us, quickly remedied. And if, if we allow hunger and thirst to persist, persist, most of the time that's because of an active choice that we make. It's I'm, I'm, I'm dieting or I'm fasting or something of that nature. But for many in our world and for many who were listening to Jesus teach on that side of the mountain, they knew what it meant to be hungry. Jesus now connects blessing Congratulations, right? How good is the life for those who hunger and who thirst for right relationships, who know they're missing something. Blessed are you when you know that we live in a broken world. Blessed are you when we know of our own personal brokenness, that things are not as they should be. Blessed are you when you know that you're in a painful state of lacking, Jesus says. This is where the visions of, of these various kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms that, that, the kingdom that Jesus describes are really in conflict with each other. Around how they answer the question of what fills or what satisfies. The kingdom of this world tells us that what we lack, what, what we're hungry for, will be satisfied with more power or more money or more status, or more sex, or you fill in the, the, the proverbial idol that, that you're tempted to pursue. Ray Ortberg uh, wrote, wrote a, what he calls the unbeatitudes. And he, uh, at the top of this article, he's got a, a picture um, that is up, and it shows kind of the contrasting visions from It's a Wonderful Life. Do you have that? Is that in there? There it is. Yeah, this, 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 think of this as two contrasting visions of a kingdom. Um, two e contrasting experiences. And he, he puts up these unbeatitudes and he says this. He says, congratulations to the entitled, for they grab what they want. Congratulations to the carefree, for they shall be comfortable. Congratulations to the pushy, for they shall win. Congratulations to the, the greedy, for they shall climb the food chain. Congratulations to the vengeful, for they shall be feared. Congratulations to those who don't get caught, for they shall look good. Congratulations to the argumentative, for they shall get the last word. Congratulations to the popular, for this world lies at their feet. And the reality is, when we hear these and we understand if we, if we were to remove that from having just read Jesus' description of the Beatitudes, and we were to think of it through the lens of our culture and our world, we would say that makes perfect sense. That that is what our world tells us that we're missing, what we're longing for, what we're hungry for. It's, it's Pottersville, right? And Jesus, on the other hand, says the, we're blessed when we understand what we lack is Righteousness. Right, that, that, that we're all hungry for something. And that the cause of our hunger pains is, is these right relationships that we're missing. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what, what are we hungry for? And if we were to obtain that, 
If that was to be satisfied with whatever it is that we were chasing after, would it ultimately fill us? Would it ultimately meet that need? Which brings us then to this, this second aspect of this, the object of the hunger, which Jesus defines as righteousness. So let's take a moment to look at, at the righteous. Now Jesus clearly defines the object of this hunger and thirst in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We need to spend just a few moments looking together at, at what Jesus identifies, what he means when he uses this word righteousness. For most of us, what, what we uh, conjure up in our minds, it's a very churchy, very sort of religious word. Oftentimes we associate it with like a, a, a sense of personal holiness, like a, a personal moral code that we operate with. This, this topic of righteousness, it's a theme that Jesus is going to hit on multiple times throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He addresses it throughout the Gospel of, of Matthew, and when Jesus uses this word, at its core meaning is that this is a very relational word. So it's more than just a personal moral code or personal, uh, 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 personal holiness. It's living in right relationship with. So righteousness is being in right relationship with our creator, with God. Righteousness is being in right relationship with each other. Righteousness is being in right relationship with the created world around us. We know the, the feeling, the experience of when, when we are out of sync relationally, right? Think for a moment about a time you've been in conflict with, with somebody that you either care about or that you work closely with. Um, and, and, and you guys are sort of out of sync. Like, how do you act when that's the case? You avoid each other, maybe? Or like the, the, the silent treatment? Or if your wife asks you, like, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? You say, I'm fine. Because mentally you're thinking you ought to know what's going on, Right? Like you, you operate in this, this sort of dysfunction that exists and there's something that when you're in the experience of you internally, you're just sort of thinking to yourself like this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't how we're designed to be together. Or if the relationship's long term, you, you know what it's like when you're in sync and it's bothering you. Right, the vision of, of righteousness in scripture finds its source all the way back in the creation narrative. When we go back and we read humanity, uh, humanity's experience prior to sin entering the story, what it's describing to us is righteousness. It's right relationship. Everyone is in right relationship with God. They're in right relationship with each other. And the byproduct or the result of it is flourishing. Life is expanding and it's abounding. This also, by the way, explains our hunger. We, we have a, a longing woven into us from design, our design as image bearers. And when sin broke in, when it was when humanity decided that we would define good and evil on our own terms, the immediate impact, the immediate result was relational separation and conflict. In fact, look back in, in Genesis 3. What instantly happens once there's this loss of, of right relationship? This is after Adam and Eve have sinned, and in Genesis 3, God is seeking them out. In verse 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? which already just, there's just this deep sense of grief over what is lost here. He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So once there was relational proximity, once there was community, now there's separation and there's shame and there's hiding. And it doesn't stop there immediately. So it's not only between humanity and God, but it's humanity into each other. So in verse 12, right, God confronts Adam. 
And then, then the man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Notice what Adam immediately begins to do. To, to, to cast blame. Then there's, there's a break in the relationship between him and his wife, between him and Eve. And not only is he blaming Eve, he also, did you notice, he's also sort of blaming God here. Like, you gave her to me. Like, you, have, you bear some responsibility. There's just brokenness all over the story. The relationship is not right. It's unrighteous. Every act of, of cruelty, every bit of oppression, every dishonest word that's intended to elevate ourselves and trample on someone else, every injustice, every subjugation, every selfish act finds its source from this singular stream. It all flows from here. And we have been hungry and thirsty ever since to regain what was lost, to be once again in right relationship with our creator and with each other. And the consequence of all of this, the byproduct of this is instead of flourishing, it's now the onset of, of death. Flourishing has been replaced with dying. Jesus says this and then when he's talking about righteousness, he's, he's saying, I'm not merely describing just right rules. This kind of righteousness that he's describing is not just this personal moral code. In fact, Jesus has a word for those who, who are experts in adhering to the law and at the same time have no problem trampling the innocent and the marginalized and the vulnerable, like the, the Old Testament, the triumvirate of the the weak, right? The, the widow and the orphan and the immigrant. The Old Testament comes back to this time and time again. And when Jesus confronts the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, he's saying you're adhering to all kinds of aspects of the law and you're trampling over these people. And he calls them hypocrites. This hunger and thirst is for things to be made right. I'm going to read from, from the Bible project here, but Mackey writes this. He says, with his words, Jesus sets a table and invites those listening to experience a nourishing way of life that satisfies our longing for good relationships with all people. This is the kind of relating that defines Jesus' kingdom way of life. Jesus' tender words have the transformative power inviting us to abandon our hunger for self-sufficiency and power. Like loving parents gently lifting their child's gaze to meet their own, Jesus invites us to be transformed by a desire for right relationship with himself and one another. Be like me, he says. Allow your perspective of the world to be turned upside down and yearn for a new way of living and relating. And to this hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus adds a promise. He says, they will be filled. So let's briefly here look at, at what Jesus means when he talks about the filled. If you can think, if you can return for a moment to that, that experience that you had where you experienced genuine hunger, like kind of a, like desperate hunger if you've ever experienced that in your life. Now think to yourselves, what was it like when that need was met? When that satisfaction came? I, I, I mentioned this before, but back in the day when I was a student pastor and I would go on all these different mission trips with kids and be in, in, um, in, in Milwaukee and then sometimes fly to Mexico and fly from Mexico to Ecuador and, and then eventually get home and Sherry and the girls would be there at the airport to meet me, right? Like the, the very first stop on our trip home was always Portillo's, right? There was this need for a chili cheese dog that had to be satisfied without fail. Like now sometimes if I'm just gone for like the afternoon, I just drive over to Portillo's. Like, <laughs> like we, can all, we can all recall an experience of, of being satisfied, being filled. Right? What Jesus is describing here is this experience of when the state of lacking meets the abundance of God. 
We've talked about the kingdom as being the place where heaven and earth overlap. When we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness in this world, we become, Jesus becomes, uh, or forms us in, in agents of his kingdom work. So that we start to live now with this kingdom vision that Jesus has been teaching and proclaiming. And, and as we begin to live this out, it starts to produce in things like, in us, things like generosity and advocacy and unity and proximity and mercy. We start to take on who he is to the world. And the old appetite, that appetite for power and self-promotion, which, which I would suggest is something like a sugar high. Like something that provides some type of temporary satisfaction, but then quickly dissolves into feeling sick and regret. There's this exchange that happens for the fullness of this kingdom way. In the here and now, when we experience it in our relationships with each other, it's like getting a sample. It's like that, that sample of what is to come. So when I am out of right relationship with a, a friend or a spouse and that's restored, it's a sample of, of what God is doing in our lives. And when you see a kid who's distant from their family and that relationship becomes close again, it's this sample. And you see uh, oppression or injustice and, and God mobilizes his people to step into that and there's, there's things that, are, that were wrong that are corrected and or if, if, if there's somebody in my life who has need and I have extra and you're able to take that and say, can I, can I walk with you? And you just, can you, it's all samples of what God is ultimately going to do. Of the full realization of his kingdom. And as always, this, this, the fullest provision of this is experience. It's discovered in Jesus himself. Right, these, nine, these nine statements of blessing, these aren't transactional. These aren't Jesus saying, if you do this, then I will bless you. This is Jesus saying, you are blessed. You who are hungry, because your hunger is satisfied ultimately in me. One more time from the Bible Project. It says, as an ultimate expression of this righteous way, Jesus willingly gives up his life. His death is at, once a, is, is, uh, is at once a demonstration of humanity's cruel hunger for power and God's boundless mercy, justice, and determined pursuit for right relationship. In the words of Paul to the Corinthian church, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Saying in, in, in him that I want you to experience the kind of relationship I have with the Father. I'll take on the sin and I'll place on you, I'll impute on you my righteousness. Set you back in right relationship with him. Jesus is the one who satisfies our hunger and thirst to be in right relationship with our creator. And he is the one who is teaching us in his kingdom way how to live in right relationship with each other. Let's pray together. Father, again, we just thank you for this time just to be in your word. We thank you again for what we get to celebrate today and, and remembering 130 years of your faithfulness to your church. And we pray that we would continue to be shaped and formed into this vision of those in your kingdom, those who hunger and thirst for things to be made right, to be in right relationship. And God, we thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, who is the one who is our satisfaction, who fills that greatest need, that greatest longing in our lives. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I, I know we're out of time, uh, and, but it, there's so much about just that word abide that, that is uh, relevant to what we just talked about, where he, he, the one who meets our hunger and thirst is found in abiding in, in him. Um, so read John 15 this week sometime. Um, real quick, two last things. Just a reminder, next week is the Markland 5K. We're excited for that. We have filled all the positions that we need for 
marshals in the race, um, but it's not too late to sign up to either run the 5K or walk the 5K. Uh, or, and I think there might be a mile option too. Um, we're gonna ask Elena Maminga. She's gonna be our pace setter. She just ran like a 1726 5K, which ironically is the same time it takes me to walk half a mile. So um, we're excited for that. Just be aware coming next week, you may run into some traffic disruption out there especially if you come through the Mill Creek neighborhood. Um, it should be done by the second service, uh, but you may want to give yourself a, a little extra time. And then I'm going to send this out in an email this week, but we get to participate in the trunk or treat with our friends at Mercy Housing again this year. Um, and we're going to, we volunteered to bring some dinner over for that. We're excited for that, but we need some volunteers to help us serve there. Um, and so if you're, and really what I'm looking for is just, um, those of you who are just able and willing to connect race, uh, relationally, to have friendships with people, start a conversation. Uh, we're serving walking tacos. It's gonna be a great time. We're, our, our kids ministry is gonna have one of the booths as well to, to give out some little gifts. So we're excited for that. Look for an email from me this week and I'll, I'll highlight both of those things. Um, as always, if we can pray with you, it's a privilege to do that. Our generosity boxes are there by the side door uh, if you came prepared to give this morning. Now receive the benediction. Go in the name of Jesus Christ, who's the one who has called us blessed when we're aware of what we lack, aware of what we're missing, and that you are the one standing in front of us as the one who fills us, who satisfies us. We move, every need be met in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.